What's up you guys? I am back with another video and as you guys can tell that the title down below, this video is going to be going over clinicals and class schedules. If you guys don't know me, my name is T. I am a senior nursing student. I am in my last year of nursing school. I have nine months and 30 days to be exact, but who's counting? Um, and today's video, like I said, is going to be going over everything you need to know about your schedule, how my schedule has been, how your schedule may look, and how clinical schedules look as well. So if you guys are interested in seeing what that is all about, then stay with your girl. of nursing as you guys all probably know right now and I am in my senior year of nursing school at Gatlin and so far my schedules have been pretty jam-packed I am gonna go through with you guys the last two quarters what my schedule has looked like um, but I just want to touch on a few things before I pull up some pictures of that number one is that you're not gonna always have the clinical day that you wanted or per se like the clinical day that you would have preferred um, my campus is now choosing clinical days for us. We no longer have the privilege of picking our clinical days. So since they're picking them for us, we just kind of have to be there on whatever day they give us and just make it work. Um, last quarter, well not even last quarter, the quarter before last, we were able to pick our clinical days when I was in the fundamentals, but now I am in OB and Peds and last quarter I was in med surge and pharmacology and we were not allowed to pick our clinical days they were picked for us and we just kind of had to show up on those days um, the second thing I want to point out is that you may have more than one clinical instructor this quarter I have had so far uh, three different clinical instructors the first clinical instructor I had uh, was for OB she ended up finding a full-time job so she wasn't our clinical instructor throughout the rest of our six-week rotation in OB um, and then we ended up having a different instructor for the last two weeks of our OB rotation the other part of it which is the part that I'm in now which is peds I have a totally separate clinical instructor who is going to be with us or hopefully be with us for the duration of our six weeks of our peds rotation um, so that's the other thing I want you guys to be aware of you may not always be able to pick your instructors nor will you always have the same instructor if you do kudos to you if you don't just kind of go with the flow uh, the last thing I want to point out about clinicals is the clinical packets and the expectations um, my clinicals start pretty early I was not privileged enough to get afternoon clinicals or get like um, weekend clinicals. I know some people have that privilege, I did not. My clinicals start at six o'clock and they go till noon. Last quarter, my clinical started at 6.30 a.m. and they went till 6.30 p.m. Um, when I was in med surge, I had 12 hour clinical rotations, you guys, 12 hours. Okay, and it's free. You are not getting paid for it. Nobody tells you thank you. You're not being appreciated. None of that. It is just you're here, you're here to help, and they expect you to help regardless. So that's what it is. Um, it was 12 hours last quarter, and this quarter has been six hour rotations. Some of the expectations that you're going to have to deal with in clinical is that the PCTs will expect you to do some of their work, believe it or not. The nurses will want you to do things that they know you cannot do or not supposed to do, especially if they know you work at the hospital, like me, for instance, I work at the hospital in ICU and when I had my clinical rotation last quarter that was 12 hours in neuroscience um, I had a lot of nurses that recognized my face and would ask me to do stuff that they know I'm not supposed to do when I'm in my Galen scrubs so that's another thing 
Um, your clinical instructors, if they know you work at the hospital, will want you to do things that they know you're not supposed to do in your school uniform, like bring your work badge with you on your clinical days to get in and out of different places in the hospital or on the floor because they don't want to ask the nurses on the floor for help consistently. Um, just don't feed into it, you guys. It's not, it's not going to be good. <laughs> um, Another thing that they're going to expect from you is your clinical packets. And the clinical packets vary. Let me say that. Um, when I was in when I was in fundamentals, the clinical packets were like three-ish pages, I think. And it wasn't too much. Like it was doable. It wasn't like too much stuff that you had to go over or write down or like dig into in order to you know get it done um my clinical packets and fundamentals had an assessment page it had a narrative page and it had a page for the care plan um so of course you had to do your head to toe assessment which we all will learn or you guys will learn or i learned in fundamentals so they're going to expect you to be able to fill that out when you go and do your fundamental rotations at your clinical site on your patient for the day and then you're, they're going to want you to write a narrative on how your patient was presented to you how your patient interacted with other people or by themselves throughout the day um, and how they were before you left the clinical site. And then on your care on your care plan, they're going to want you to come up with three different nursing diagnoses. Um, like for instance, if you had a patient that was on, let's see, that was in therapy because they broke their hip, you can use the nursing diagnosis of activity intolerance related to um, hip displacement as evidenced by hip or leg and cast that would be a typical nursing diagnosis and then like your um, interventions one intervention could be like you know um, ambulation with assistance as tolerated or encourage ambulation with assistance as tolerated another intervention could be um, promote proper diet and fluid intake um, which would help with the healing process. So we all know we need proteins to heal. We need vitamins to heal. So you guys get where I'm going with that. And then like another nursing diagnosis could be like, um, let's see, we did activity, food and water intake. And then another one could be like, encourage patient to take pain medication before the pain begins not when the pain has started just so that way they stay on top of their medications they stay on top of when they take them make sure that they're taking them the correct way and in the correct dosaging it's all teaching because that's what we are we're nurses we teach um so that is all of the things that you could put on that care plan and then at the bottom it's going to ask you for a short-term goal and a long-term goal which i'll insert a picture of this you guys so it makes more sense but so like a short term goal would be like, I'm gonna insert the picture like up here in the corner somewhere. But a short term goal would be like, um, patient was able to ambulate with assistance by end of shift. And then a long term goal would be like, patient was able to demonstrate correct medication administration by discharge. That is how they want your goals set up. Um, you need to have one that is for short term, which would be like by the end of shift, and one that was for long term, that would be like by discharge. That is how they want it to be. That's how they want it to look. Um, and then you'll have a little line at the very bottom of that section that'll say evaluation, and you would just put in there, goal met, patient was able to ambulate with assistance by end of shift. That is a care plan, but you're gonna have three of those. You gotta come up with three nursing diagnoses for your patient, not just one. All of that that I just mentioned, you guys, <laughs> is for one nursing diagnosis. So I'm gonna show you guys a picture of this so this will make more sense, but that is how you are going to do your nursing diagnosis. Um, and that's pretty much all the expectations for clinical that I can think of that I feel like are like super important to touch on. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and get right into, you know, the clinical schedule and school schedule. 
Okay, you guys, so what you guys are looking at right now is the schedule that I had for last quarter. This is for med surge, and in the next clip, you guys will see that it is for um, pharmacology as well. But this is kind of what it looked like. Um, and then I'll show you guys a view of the calendar portion of what it looks like as well. But those right there are the dates for my quarter, which was last quarter. It started on the 6th of April and went until the 26th of June. And um, the meeting times are also going to be on the calendar view. So I'll show you guys that in a second. But obviously, as you guys can see, um, it has two sets of numbers at the top. So the first set is going to be for the class. That's how you find your class or your clinical or your lab. And then the second set of numbers after the dash, so like the top one says 11D06, that's going to be whatever section you're in for that class. And then right here, as you guys can see, this is for farm. So it started at the same time. Um, it also shows you how many credits it is. And as you guys can see, my med search class was nine credits and pharmacology was four. It is pass fail only, but you guys knew that already. If you're in nursing school or looking into going into nursing school, you guys know that there is no wiggle room in this. It is pass or fail. Um, and as for farm, I was in the first section. So as I said at the top, it says NUR210. That is the class name. And the dash 11D01 is for the section. So I was in the first section last quarter for the pharmacology course. Um, I did go ahead and cross out the instructors just to make sure that I don't, you know, expose any sensitive information that nobody wants to have on the internet. But that is the class layout and now I'm going to show you guys the schedule of it. So the schedule here as you guys can see last quarter like I said I had 12 hour clinical rotations so you see the first one on Monday is the 12 hours and then my classes were on Tuesday and Thursday. Lab was on Thursday as well so that's that 11 do 2 at the bottom with the 170L in it. And right here, this is for my current quarter. I am in OB and Peds, like I mentioned to you guys before in some of my previous videos. I did go ahead and cross out my instructor's names right there. As you guys can see, like I mentioned for my lab, my clinical, I have several instructors and have had several different instructors. So um, as you guys can see up there at the top, it says NUR230L. So this is for my lab and the one above it is for my theory class it says childbirth and child caring family um that's still ob and P's. you guys don't let that confuse you the lab is factored into the theory for this quarter because it's ob and P's in one quarter so the lab's gonna say zero credits so don't worry about that and as you guys can see this quarter started on july 10th and goes all the way to september 26th so we are in August. We are almost there, baby girl. We just got to hold on and get through it. And in this next clip, I'm going to show you guys um, what the clinical and lab layout looks like. And then right here, you guys can see the OB and PEDS class altogether is worth 10 credits. So like I mentioned before, I've had several clinical instructors. That's why you guys see so many names marked out right there. My clinical instructors have been bounced around like no other. Um, but I have one for peds right now. And so far, it seems like she is going to stick with us. So we are just kind of like holding on and hoping for the best with that. But that's why there's so many names crossed out there. It all started at the same time. I am in the fifth section for clinical and the first section for theory. I have had two different theory instructors, one for OB and one for PEDS, but all together it is pass fail for 10 credits for the entire quarter. OB and PEDS is split up into six sections. So you have six weeks of OB and six weeks of PEDS. And right now I am in PEDS. So now I'm gonna show you guys the schedule or calendar layout. So right here, you guys can see, I have Monday is my clinical um, and Tuesday is my clinical also. And then on Thursday and Friday, I have class and labs. Let me break this down a little bit. So Monday, or it says down there at the bottom from 1230 to six, that is for SimLab. That is only twice 
in the quarter just strictly for OB and peds. It is for us to get hands-on training for delivery and, you know, like complications. My actual clinical is on Tuesday from 6 a.m. until 12 p.m. Class and lab together is on Thursday. And then I just have theory on Friday by itself. So hopefully that made a little bit more sense to you guys as to what that looks like and how my schedules look. And now I'm going to dive into the clinical packets a little more to give you guys like a visual of what I meant by the clinical packets. So right here, you guys can see that in the clinical packets, how it's laid out right here, it is pretty in depth. It's gonna go over every single system that we have learned in nursing school, and you're going to have to be able to put it on paper. So you really wanna look at everything that's on here. I am in OBMPs right now, like I mentioned, so of course I'm looking at the fontanelles, the speech, motor, color, temperature, condition, mucous membrane, skin turgor, skin integrity, hair, wounds, you know, all that stuff is factored into this clinical packet when you go down to cardiac we're listening to your normal stuff like your rate your rhythm your pulse cap refill when you get down to gastro we're listening to bowel sounds any complications last bowel movements if the baby has any tubes if the baby's breastfed or formula and the strength of the formula if they are on formula all of that is super 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 important i can't stress it enough especially the breast or bottle fed that's like one of the main things that makes a difference in a baby's immunity so that is something you really need to focus on. And also we're gonna be looking at the IV site. So you're gonna to wanna to know if they have a pick line, a midline, a central line, um, if they have a tegaderm over it, or if it's just taped down, what the dressing looked like when the kid was given to you, if there was any drainage, if it had any foul smells, or if it was infiltrated. All this stuff is super important, especially when you're dealing with a baby. Um, because, you know, their immune systems aren't like ours. They're just not up to par like ours. So it's really good to make sure that we have all this information on packet. Okay, now in the second part of the clinical packet, this is the back side of that front page. It is going over like the skin portion. We're also going to be talking about how the baby is fed or how the toddler is fed, depending on which one you have. Um, and then we're also going to be going into respiratory rate rhythm and how everything sounds and like how everything is um, sounding, like how the lungs sound. I'm sorry, you guys, I had like a seizure or something. Um, how the lung sounds and all that stuff when you listen to them is also their bowel sounds too. Um, so the, the baby that I had here, you guys can see based off of my assessment, he had asthma and was having recurrent asthma attacks. Um, so I was doing my clinical packet based off of that. There was no change in his weight, so I did not have to worry about him having any kind of fluid shift like intracellular or extracellular within his body. Um, he was getting as much rest as he could. He was having quite a few spells where he wasn't able to breathe very well. So he was getting Q1 hour albuterol, um, albuterol treatments with respiratory and then I was also giving him Q five hour which I only got to give him one but he was getting Q five hour albuterol treatments as well kind of like double dosing him or triple dosing him if you will with albuterol as a first line defense before we do anything else um, as someone who works in ICU I believe that was the best thing to do as well if he doesn't get any better it's sad to say but he may into end up being an intubated child because he could run into that extracellular fluid and then he would become um status asthmaticus which is a life-threatening situation especially for a toddler um so that is what his respiratory assessment looked like he was symmetrical um the alignment was correct his strength he had a full range of motion his respiration effort though was shallow and he had some very loud strider going on he had an unproductive cough he only started to cough when he got worked up and he was breathing faster when his heart rate got up in the 50s i mean not heart rate i'm sorry when his respiration rate got up in the 50s that's when the coughing started when it was down in the 30s and 40s he wasn't doing any coughing so i made that non-productive um, he was on two 
he was on four liters of oxygen and a non-rebreather and you guys can see his vital signs right down there i did make a note that his strider was present and the lower lobes and cough present with speech um like i said that was only when he got worked up otherwise he was not coughing and he was just a really cool kid to hang out with i would love to take care of that little boy any day of the week um now we are going to look at his genital urinary tract and then we're going to go on to vision ears nose and throat so for his gap his um sorry his genital urinary um he was a continent i did visually see him go to the bathroom um and then you know obviously all the stuff that comes with that part we're not going to dig too much in that because youtube will you know take it down if we get too 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 into the body parts so yeah but you guys can see everything there and then this is just a quick picture of what i was telling you guys about with the clinical package since i'm in peds now we do concept maps instead of having an entire layout for the care plan we do concept maps so i did mine on the child who had asthma i used ineffective airway clearance and decreased activity intolerance as my two nursing diagnoses and then uh, right under that under priority nursing diagnosis you guys can see the entire layout of what the nursing diagnosis was that i chose which was ineffective airway clearance related to tracheal trach tracheal bronchial narrowing as evidenced by coffin strider um, and then my second one was decreased activity and intolerance related to disease process of asthma as evidenced by wheezing and crackles which you guys could hear that um, just standing next to him you did need to put your stethoscope on him to hear it once you did put it on him though you could hear that it was in all lobes it was very loud he was very moist in there and he needed to get those secretions out of there in order to breathe better um like I was telling you guys before, we have those nursing interventions and the rationales that come with them. We also have expected clinical manifestations and the pathophysiology and the expected laboratory results. All right, you guys, so that is pretty much it. That sums it up. Thank you guys so much for sticking with me through this video, going over your school schedule and your clinical schedule, and also going over a few things about clinical that I felt like should be touched on. I will upload a video, you guys don't worry, on clinical. I probably will do like a day in the life video of what it's like um, going to clinical and you know like how I get ready for clinical and like how early I have to get up and how we pre-brief and debrief and you know just little clips throughout the day as I can. I most likely will do that. But anyways, I will see you guys in the next video.